Okay, welcome to my presentation on state UI and the stuff in between. My name is Christian Alfoni, and I am the author of a, a library called Cerebral. But I also do other stuff, like uh, address bar, which basically just converts the address bar in the browser to an input, so you can listen to changes on it, you can change the value of it without any side effects. Uh, and I also co-founded a project called Webpack uh, React Cookbook, together with a guy who calls himself Bibro online. Uh, he's the guy maintaining it now, but I recommend you check that out. I also brought the Yahoo Dispatcher to, to Angular with the Flux Angular project. And I also have a project called FormC React, which is a form builder and validator for React. I have a web page at christianalfoni.com, where I mostly write about React and Webpack and stuff like that. And I'm currently working on my own project, my own little startup, actually using Cerebral to build a service to teach kids how to code and hopefully inspire them to become developers like us one day. And I do some consultancy on the side. So uh, my talk is really about complexity, how Cerebral can help us express complexity. Because we do not really want to hide complexity in our applications, and we certainly do not want to reduce it, like removing features and stuff like that. What we need is a way to express all this complexity in our applications. And Cerebral is one perspective on how we can achieve that. So this is a piece of UI. And this is how our users consume the state of our application. And actually, as a developer, I also consume the state of my application going into the UI. So if I wanted to know if this checkbox was checked, I went into the DOM and I checked if the checkbox was checked. But that's not uh, a good idea. It gets you into all sorts of problems. Um, and then React came out. And React shifted my mindset. It made me think about my application separately from my UI. So specifically, my UI is now an output of my application. And like with Backbone, I had grab state from a model, shoved it through a template, and produced some UI. But I would still go into the DOM to figure out if the checkbox was checked or if the input had some value. With Angular, it's kind of, yeah, you have this two-way data binding, so it kind of like intertwines your application with the UI. But with React, it's the complete opposite. It's like you have your application, and the output is the UI. So this is like the flow uh, inside our applications. It doesn't matter what we use to build it. Um, but what we want to achieve is to have some initial state, and we shove that through some render mechanism which produces some UI. And then something happens in the UI, and we want to change the state of our application. So the stuff in between there is really render and changing state. I'm not going to talk about render, but I am going to talk about changing the state of our applications, because it's really hard. It's really, really hard. So the smallest context with this flow is a typical view or a component with React, where you have some initial state, and then we shove that state through some render mechanism, and we produce some UI. And typically, we would like click a button, and that would run a function. And that function would change the state of the view, uh, either implicitly or explicitly cause a new render. Like with React, it's implicit. We just call set state, and it does a new render. Um, but with, for example, Backbone, we have to explicitly call render after any state change. But building applications is not just one view. We have many views all handling this flow. And we also need global state. We need global state in our applications because we want to share state between our views. And this is handled differently with different uh, libraries. Like in Backbone, you have these abstractions, different abstractions for state called model and collection. And you have lots of these entities, lots of models and lots of collections. And with Angular, you have the same kind of stuff, but it's just called something else, like resource, and service, and factory, and provider. And, and all this is about state, but it's just wrapped in APIs and stuff like that. And you can actually also think about your router as keeping some of your state, like what views am I supposed to render, what is the current URL, and stuff like that. And the problem here is that 
it's really hard to reason about all this because we're creating so many relationships inside our application, um, having all these entities representing our state, and then having these uh, wrappers uh, with all the APIs and stuff. But then we got Flux, and Flux really cleaned up this uh, stuff. Um, and the really great thing about Flux is that we moved away from having multiple abstractions for state and moved into having one abstraction called a store. Um, and that's really great. And another thing about these stores is that they are a very shallow abstraction. We don't have lots of APIs for talking to the server and stuff like that. It's just basically an object where you put other objects and stuff in. And the problem with Flux, though, is that when you want to change the state of your application, you have to, uh, often you start in the component. You have some uh, click handler or something that has some logic. And then you have the action creators, and they have some more logic related to this state change. And then you have logic inside your stores to actually produce the new state. So it's kind of like split between these three layers. And personally, I think that's hard to reason about. But then I found this project called Baobab. And Baobab is uh, a single state tree. It's just one object representing all the state of your application. So the components has the ability to point into this tree. They can point, point to specific paths and listen to changes. And what's really great now is that we do not need the dispatcher. We just need something to handle our state changes, and that is typically just functions. And these functions just has access to the tree, and they can change the state uh, on the tree. And what's very nice is with the latest version of React, we can have stateless components. And this image is something I really like. It's the same flow I started with, but now it's more in a global perspective. So now the components only does rendering. And then you have a layer for changing the state of your application, and you have a single entity representing the state of your application. So I built applications like this for some time, and this is typically how I would change the state of my application. I will write a function, in this case called get to dos, but it does more than getting the to dos. It's also changing the loading state, it's setting the to dos, or it's setting an error. The point is that to understand this change, you have to read all the implementation details. And this is a really simple function. Uh, you can imagine how complex this can get, and you have to read all the implementation details. So I wanted to make this better, and I looked at uh, different places, but ended up actually looking at like the good old days, where we have just HTML in the browser. Easy to build applications. But these applications also needed to change their state. So what they did to change their state was typically with a form, like we wanted to post a new to-do. And this post request is actually a request for state change. And what handles this request for state change is the router. And the router commonly has a concept of middleware, where you have multiple functions, each of them performing a specific task. Now, what I like about middleware is that it is expressed as a flow. As I said, you have one function doing one thing, then the next function does something. But it also uh, has this request object. So you're not limited to only operating on the output of the previous function. You can kind of like share state as you move through this state change. Um, so taking this into account, now we're back in the client. And we're going to talk about Cerebral. So Cerebral kind of like fits in between your state and the UI. And the way it changes the state of your application is using something called signals. So something happens in the UI or some other part of your application, and it fires off a signal. And this signal has actions. And it's just functions that has access to changing the state of your application. Um, so the, the thing here is that typically with Flux, we do a state change, and that specific state change uh, tells the UI to do a change. That's not how it works in Cerebral. With Cerebral, it's the signal that decides when it's time for the UI to update itself. Going okay? <laughs> 
And so smack right in the middle between your state and UI, you find Cerebral. And now we're going to dive a step like deeper. And we're going to talk about these signals and actions. So the way you build a signal is by composing actions into something we call chains. You might uh, think of pipes, maybe. But I think of them as chains. And these chains can be composed into a signal. So in this case, we have just one signal with one chain and three actions. So something happens in the UI, and, it, and Cerebral runs the first action. That action changes some state in the state tree. And then it runs the second action, which actually grabs some state from the state tree. And I want to access my current state when I am changing my state. For example, if I'm changing like, the state of an issue in my project application, I need the ID of the project. And I don't want to necessarily pass that through the component. I want to just be able to access it. I might need some information from the user or whatever to, to do this state change. And then it will run the last action doing some state change, and then it notifies the UI about uh, an update. But we have to do more complex stuff than this. So we have to do asynchronous stuff. So imagine that uh, this first action is changing some loading state. And then Cerebral sees that the next action in line is asynchronous. So what it does is just poke the UI and tells it that, OK, I have some changes for you now. I'm going to do something asynchronous so you can update yourself. And then it runs this asynchronous action, which is typically a request to the server. And the response from the server can be like success, error, not authorized, not found, whatever. The thing is that this asynchronous action can output to a specific path. So in this case, you can imagine that the asynchronous action outputs to a success path. And this path is just a chain with one action, changing some state and then notifying the UI that it can update itself. But we have to do even more complex stuff than this. We also want to run parallel asynchronous stuff. Um, so we can imagine here that we have two requests to the server, one of them taking one second to respond, a long time, but just for an example. And that results in a success. So after one second, it will run the success chain, running just one action. But the other uh, asynchronous action takes a bit longer. And when it's done, it will run its success or error chain. And then finally, when all this is done, it will run the last action and then update the UI. So we're going to take a crash course in signals. So I'm going to use the example I had earlier uh, with, um, with Baobab. Uh, so the way you would express this with a signal is first naming it. And by convention, the name should be what happened inside your application for this signal to trigger. It's just easier to reason about stuff that way. So in this case, when the application mounts, we have defined a chain. And the first item of this chain is set loading to do's. And set loading to do's is just referencing an action, just a function. I'm not going to talk about these actions because I just don't have time for it, but it's just a function receiving some arguments, making you able to change your state and stuff. The second item inside this chain is an array. So an array inside a chain means that the actions inside it will run asynchronously. So get to do's in this example will run asynchronously. And then we have an object after that get to do's. And this object represents paths. So in this case, get to do, the get to do section can output either a success or an error. If it's a success, it will run a chain containing one action called set to do's. Or if it's an error, it will run one chain uh, containing uh, set to do's error action. And when all of this stuff is done, it will run that last action and set loading to do's. So what we're going to do now is have a little demo. So let me do this correctly. Hello? OK, let's try this. Um, OK, so what you're seeing here is the typical to-do MVC application, only running with Cerebral. Uh, so you have the typical UI here on the left side, but you also have the Cerebral uh, debugger. So Cerebral has a Chrome extension, uh, 
which is its own debugger. So what happens here when I change the UI is that you can see what signals were triggered when doing this state change inside the application. So you see what signal triggered, what actions were run, what input did it have, what state mutations did it do. Um, and if I hit enter here, we can see a more complex example with more actions and some asynchronous actions, inputs, outputs, and all that good stuff. And now we can see how, like we often underestimate the complexities of what we do. And adding a to-do seems like a really simple thing. But it is actually quite complex, as we can see here. There's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, what's also really nice is if I click this model up here, we can see the complete state of the application. And what I'm talking about now are like these three layers. You have your UI, which of course the browser handles, but you can also see the state changes of your application using the debugger. And you can at any time see what is the complete state of my application right now. Um, and the big hype these days is time travel debugging. Um, and you can do that because Cerebral knows about everything that's happening inside their application. So you can do that. We actually used to have a slider here because I remember the Elm example. Uh, but the slider is just really cool. It's not very practical. So we decided to have some buttons here instead. Um, OK, I could talk more about this, but I'm actually not going to do Yeah, OK, I want to mention one more thing. It's like um, you have no insight into the code of, of this application. But if you were able to read the, the signals here, you would actually get an understanding of what does this application do? What is it trying to achieve? And I think that's really powerful, that you can just grab a developer, open up the dev tools, and just start playing around the UI, and you understand the internals of the application. All right. Um, so I said I was going to talk about complexity. So this is complexity for you. And you're probably thinking now, like, oh, what, what, what is this? But I'm going to make a sta statement now, and that is that when you read this, you will understand uh, what it tries to do. So we're going to go through some of it now. Um, as we can see here, it's trying to load an access token at the very top here. And two different things can happen. Either that token is found, or it's not found. If it's not found, it will try to log in. And that can result in a success or an error. If it's a success, it will set the access token, and then it will try to verify that token. I'm not going to go through all the rest of it. But this was an example pasted by uh, a guy named Brian on the Gitter channel. Uh, hi, Brian. Thanks for the example. Uh, and he wanted to ask us some questions. Now, we didn't know anything about uh, the implementation details of this application. We didn't even know that this was related to Google and their access tokens. But he wanted feedback on this. And one of, uh, some of that feedback was, uh, why do you have to verify the token after you have a successful login? And what Brian answered is, OK, it's just in the Google documentation. I have to do that. But I think it's kind of nice that we were able to ask that question without reading any implementation details. Um, and then we have like these scenarios. So when we handle complexity, I think most of our bugs are scenarios not handled. You know, you create some request and you have the catch, and then you really, oh, I can do that later. But it's very explicit here what scenarios should be handled. So what we could tell Brian is that, OK, when you when you verify the token over here, why are you not ha handling the token invalid scenario? And we have the same thing down here. It's verifying the token, but it's not handling the scenarios. So you can kind of like sit together and you can build these signals, not implementing any code at all. And everybody talks about and understands the flow of changing the state of the application. So uh, it's, of course, possible to refactor this. Um, I like to express it mostly like you saw on the previous slide. But since these are just functions, these actions are functions, you have the possibility to just use normal JavaScript. Uh, for example, factories. So instead of having a get to do section, as we see here, you can have an action factory. So it's just a function that takes an argument, and it returns an action using, in this case, the URL. Uh, 
But you can use, also use a new spread operator from uh, ES2015. Um, and you can just put actions and paths and whatever you want into arrays. And then you can just spread these wherever you want. You compose it together. Um, and you can even create chain factories. So you can pass in some um, custom actions to a chain factory, and it will return a chain for you, having some default actions. So this is an example of how we could refactor Brian's example. Uh, if we see at the bottom here, that is where we have the initial chain. And we're loading the access token again. And it can be found, or it can not be found. If it's found, we run the verified token chain. But if it's not found, we run the login chain. And as we can see here in the verified token chain, it's reusing the login chain. So this is, this is like composition. And it's really f kind of fun uh, building uh, an application because as you move on, you start reusing your chains and you start reusing your actions. Um, but before I close off this uh, presentation, I forgot to set my timer. I'm not sure how we are. Oh, nice. Um, I just want to show you how do you actually use this with a component. So you would define some state in your state store, and you would create your signals. And with Cerebral, you get a decorator. So we still need stateful components. We, we need to listen, like grab state from other places and do other stuff. And so what you would do is create a component that uses the Cerebral decorator. And this basically just means that, OK, I want an isloading state and a to-do state inside my component. And I'm going to grab that state from isloading path and to-do's path. And inside your component, you have access to props. So this state will be available on the props object. And you also have access to the signals themselves. So you say like props.signals.appmounted, and you can call that signal. You know, this went quite well. <laughs> I'm finished. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, maybe it can help you out. Great. Cool. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of questions from Slido that we will create if you can answer in the remaining five minutes. Uh -huh. mm. uh, <laughs> which benefits Cerebral have over Read? So, um, Redux doesn't really have a concept for handling complex state changes. You have like this action creator, which basically is just uh, a function, and then you have you have to like do all the requests. You have to implement everything. You do not really have an abstraction uh, over um, uh, like like with Cerebral. It's like an abstraction. Ab uh, uh, abstraction above, if that makes sense. I'm not a, like an expert in Redux. I, I'm actually working on a project now using Redux. Um, but yeah, that is my statement on that. Hopefully it makes sense. Um, callback hell. I have not met, maybe you think about the tree structure, that it looks kind of like callback hell. The example I show now is like really complex, and I want to compare it to callback hell because that's like implementation. What we're doing is declaratively expressing how our state changes should run inside our application. Uh, but maybe that's more a matter of opinion. I don't think of it like that, at least. Um, do we get runtime error? Uh, well, actually, these actions, um, if you're working in a bigger application, you have the possibility to define what outputs should this action have. And you can type check its inputs, you can type check its outputs. And so in the case uh, with the error here, you can say that this should have an error output. And if you define that, it will, um, it will instantly tell you when you fire up the application, there's something wrong in this signal. You have said that this action wants an output to an error, but I can't find it. If you do not define it, it will happen at the runtime, like when the action actually runs. What's that? How do we compound this update if you're missing? Uh, if you're not passing props down all the way, are you using it? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, so the decorator just wraps the component and listens to a change event on 
what we call the controller. Cerebral is a controller. And when the change happens, it will do a shallow check on the paths. So it's important here that the state uh, tree is immutable. So you can use immutable JS, or you can use Baobab, for example. Um, and yes, there's some events happening in the background. And yeah, I just answered that. Immutable JS, yes, it works. Is it already used in production? Uh, the project I'm working on now is not in production. Um, but there are uh, multiple projects using it now. And so I can say, no, it's not production ready right now, but it will be during this year. Fantastic, great, thank you very much.